April 13, 1982, 524 West 162nd Street, NYPD officers Joe Sanchez and partner Herman Velez made a drug bus which turned into a Serpico-like setup minus the bullet to the face. Why is this significant, Joe? Well, this building, 524 West 162nd Street, back in April 13th of 1982, it was a turning point in my career with the NYPD. I was working in 8, rather at 412 with my partner, Herman Velez, yeah. Sector George, and uh, we spotted a male black exiting a vehicle, a uh, tall male black, about 6'2", wearing a cowboy hat, acting very suspiciously, and we followed him to this uh, location uh -huh. while notifying Central what we were doing. Right. And he, ent he entered this building. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll make it quick, but he entered this building, and I'll guide you exactly where he went up to the okay. fourth floor. So this was a turning point in the worst yeah. way. It was the worst nightmare. Yes, it was. I mean, Serpico is the rock star of NYPD uh, whistleblowers. got shot in the face. They just shot your career down because you were a whistleblower. Yes, they did. The mail went up to uh, apartment 4B. And as I wrote in my book, we weren't too far behind him and keeping in touch with Central with what we were doing. Uh-huh. And uh, like I said, went up to the uh, wow, fourth floor. So what did it look like? Look, I'm looking at now. It, it looks pretty much the same. It looks pretty much the same? Yeah, it looked the same. And on the off was at first, he came up and he disappeared. He disappeared into apartment 4B. While he went in there, apparently, you know, we had nothing. And my partner and I were able to, we were going to go downstairs, but we heard somebody else coming up. Uh -huh. So we kind of went up to the ladder steps here and we hid over here so we wouldn't be seen. Uh -huh. Then when second guy that was coming upstairs, another he was a black youth. He was young. When as soon as he he was making a buy, my partner was behind me. Gingerly I came down. When I came down, I saw the door open up. I saw the guy holding a gun, and I told Herman, Herman, he's got a he's got a gun. But before some for some reason he never saw us, and. Before he could close the door on us, boom, we, we tried to get in, but we had this individual out in between us. Uh -huh. So it's kind of hard. But the same time he's trying to close the door back on us, he's yelling, La Policia, La Policia. And I told him, from the position I was in, drop the gun, I'm going to shoot you, drop the gun. He complied, he dropped the gun. Herman was able to recover the gun as I'm covering Herman. As soon as Herman secured the gun, put it in his waist back. I called for 1013, 1013, meaning a man with a gun. And while we can hear the units responding, uh, Sector Eddie on the way, Sector Frank on the way, Sergeant Two on the way. And uh, now, when Herman cut the, the individual we had, Herman was able to put him on the, on the floor, face down, mm -hmm. and I entered the apartment. Right. Now, in the apartment, there's, there's a wall, just like this. I entered the apartment, I reached the kitchen. Right there was the cowboy. The guy wearing a cowboy hat. Right. And there was three other individuals just standing in the kitchen. And I saw the drugs in the kitchen, the weight scale. But when I first went in, I saw somebody else running in the little room. So I, I, I used the wall to cover until the back of the rooms came. And uh, I asked one of the fellows, Sufran, uh, Sufran who, who occupied the apartment, whoever went in there, tell them to come out. I didn't want to expose myself, I didn't want to get shot. Then the backup units came. As soon as the backup units came, I was able to tell two officers, watch it, there's somebody else standing in that room. That's how it happened. We made the arrest. The sergeants responded, two sergeants responded. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Rudy, Rudy right. Landon responded. So Rudy Landon, who's now on the CCRB committee that I met, Rudy. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Remember I went to CCRB? Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so the bottom line is, is there was never time for you to do anything. You weren't no, a bad no, cop, was, you weren't no, an honest no, no, cop. No, no, no. And, and Rudy was there, who's now on the and, CCRB yeah, committee. And, and yet they tried to frame you and say you did right. bad when you didn't. There was not even time to do right. bad, but, not that you would right. even Right. Sergeant do that. Ryan also responded. He, he retired as a lieutenant. He left the 301 to the 34. But what happens when all the cops are responding, we're trying to control the situation because you got four, five individuals now on the mm -hmm. arrest. 
Right. That's when, then when the sergeant said, we clear, everything was secure, let's go. That's when the black fella said, hey, somebody here took my money. I told him, make your complaint at the prison. You're under arrest. We went downstairs and arrested. So that was the black guy with the cowboy hat? Yeah, the white but you know, so in, he, but he was the one that tried to set you up? He's the one that said, he's, he didn't mention nobody's name. He said, uh -huh. somebody here, it was full of cops. Full so of cops. he says someone did. Someone took my money. So right. what we did, when we took everybody to the precinct, others, two sectors, we had five uh, prisoners now. Yeah. Uh, uh, I went downstairs, and the Pacino Cunningham, the guy with the uh, cowboy hat, he had two girls waiting for him. Because he, he came up to make a buy for them, okay. a twelve hundred dollar buy. Wow. We went to the precinct in front of the desk. Mm -hmm. The lieutenant says, "Who's got the arrest?" So I, I said, uh, "He says Sanchez. Who's got the arrest?" Says Herman's got the collar. Mm -hmm. That's when Pacino Cunningham looked at me and said, "Your name is Sanchez, man. You're the one that took my money." Oh, so no. what are you talking about? Because he had told me, he had told me when I was in the apartment. Yeah. He had told me when I was in the apartment. Uh, somebody gets all my money. I said, well, make your complaint at the prison. He never, he said somebody. So that's how it happened. Uh, we took him upstairs to process the arrest. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if I, Antonio Sofia had to be notified. Lieutenant called Antonio Sofia, Papa Street, they called the 2 6 precinct, FIAU, mm -hmm. Antonio Sofia's precinct level. Lieutenant Verber, Verworth mm -hmm. came, uh, interviewed everybody, interviewed me, and interviewed the guy that had the gun. Mm -hmm. And when he interviewed Bertino Cunningham, Bertino Cunningham said he took my money. How do you know? Well, he was behind me. Well, there were other cops behind him. That's, right. all, that's all that happened. And they, and they framed you. Well, then they retaliated. He, well, Essentially, IAB retaliated. Right, Internal well, Affairs Bureau right. retaliated. When they interviewed all the other individuals that yeah. were in the apartment, because we arrested two girls downstairs waiting for, them, right. for, for the cowboy, yeah. uh, the driver had cocaine on her. She got busted. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they interviewed everybody else, I said, did the officer take any money from you? No, nothing except Bertino Cunningham was the only one alleged that took his money. Right, and he had a quite a history of uh, corrupt criminal behavior. Right, right, right. He went from saying that I took $1,200 from him. By the time I was indicted, it was $1,500. When I went to court, he was telling the jury it was $1,700. Mm -hmm. Everybody in that apartment also said that I took over $250. I went around, give me your money, give me your money, give me your money. Right, there the was no is, time. No, was they, were facing, they were facing three to life. Somebody got to them and says, the only way you're to beat this, testify in the grand jury against Joe Sanchez. Forget his partner. Right. Act like his partner was never there. Right. Joe Sanchez was the one that took your money. Every one of the drug dealers that I arrested at the department yeah. says that I ripped them off. Ridiculous. I know. There was never time you were never alone. No, it happened because I have ratted out. I was you whistleblow. We use the word whistleblower. Okay, I was a whistleblower. Right. I reported a very corrupt lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Captain, I was wired up by internal affairs to get these guys. And it turned out internal affairs was friends they with those them two off. guys. And they tipped them off. Internal affairs always has a habit of doing right. that, betraying the whistleblower. Right. So a year, and a, a year and a half later, I was indicted on nine count burglary in the first degree that I broke into this door. Ridiculous. I, I, I was in uniform. That I, that's all they say. You broke it. No. They said they said so. Said you never were explained. Trained. The grand jury never heard what I'm telling you now. Mm -hmm. If the grand jury had heard that, well, where's his partner? How come his partner was arrested? Mm -hmm. They kept that away from the grand jury. It was Joe Sanchez came up here, broke in here, and ripped off five drug dealers and took money from the girl down in the uh, waiting in the, uh, in, in the car. It was Never a crap. happened. Never happened. Never happened. And that was my, that's my story. And of course, I went to trial and. When you I, had never waived immunity. That's the thing. So that was the setup as well. Well, the point to this, we got them indicted. So when I told the, uh, the, uh, the DA that was handling the case, by the way, the black fellow, the cowboy hat, Bertino Cunningham, that's the election hat, took his money. So he should have said, well, then waive your immunity. He never said that. Mm -hmm. So hours later, I think it was the next day, we entered the grand jury for two bill, Herman and I. The, the law says that since I didn't waive my immunity, if anything came out of the case, you can't touch me. Right. They did it. Anyway, they did it anyway because they wanted to hang you. They want prosecutors. To... They can do. Look what's happening in Brooklyn. I know, but the thing is, is Charles Hines. Um... In the end, uh, after my, they convicted me of assault in second, third degree, Ridiculous. and they made a mistake. The jurors wrote letters, might have. They made a mistake. Right. But in the end, Thomas Duffy, with his assistant DA Joe Hester, Joe Hester was a bad ADA. He mm -hmm. lied to the jury. Right. He he come up with stories that as cops we're not supposed to follow drug dealers. Right. Ridiculous. It was ridiculous. But Charlie Joe Hines in 19 after my trial came in replaced Duffy. Mm -hmm. Word got out this guy did this cop wrong. Mm -hmm. So Charles Joe Hines dismissed my indictment, invited me to his office with my and apologized to me and says I'll testify for you in court. 
Right. And then court, if you, and get the department to trial to get you back on the job. It mm -hmm. never happened. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of a big lawsuit. I'm just a cop. Bury him. Mm -hmm. That's a shame. I served and protected this community and the city of New York. Mm -hmm. And because the powers that be felt he's a thorn to us, mm -hmm. get rid of him. They got rid of you. They got rid of me. Right. And I, fortunate for me, I became a uh, letter carrier for three years and mm -hmm. I became a correction officer. Okay, but let's say for mm -hmm. one thing, what happened was, uh, the, who was the com police commissioner? Benjamin then? Ward. And he could have reinstated yeah, you and he didn't. Right. So right. Far, right from the top, from the com the police commissioner Benjamin Ward was in right, on this. Right. He was he was true blue to the true blue wall of corruption. Well, they, well so well, he did not reinstate. Hector Soto, Hector Soto was the advocate commissioner. I talked to him. He says I signed your papers to get you back on the job. I brought it to Ward. I said get this kid back on the job. Right. The lawyers knew got a big lawsuit here. Keep him off the job, and they mm -hmm. kept me off the job. Benjamin Soto, he's not coming back. And why? Also, work up. you broke the police code of silence, and that's, that's it. That's why. You had a, a, a chest full of um, medals. You were constantly getting arrests. One of your supervisors said, I, I want you to go out today and don't make an arrest. Didn't he tell you that? I had my boss, uh, I'll name him, Frank Bieler, used to tell me, you're making too much all the time. I said, but I'm, I'm lucky enough. Burglars, guys for homicide. It's my job. Yeah, yeah but you're so one day he says, money. don't, I don't want Don't, I, no. So I left, 15 minutes later, maybe 10 minutes, I came back with an arrest. After he, he told he you not to. After he told me, I, and I looked at him and says, I'm a police officer. When I see a crime committed, I will act as a police officer. He got angry again. So they really... They, they tried, wanted you out. They wanted me out. It's really sad. Thank you so much for the interview. Thank you. We're at the uh, Prison, 451 West 151st Street. This is the Prison. It was dubbed in 1994 as the, uh, the 3030. The 3030. This was the precinct that I worked out of. Uh, when I uh, was falsely accused uh, in 1982 of April of the building that I should the location I gave you mm -hmm. at 162nd Street. This was my command. Okay. It's a good precinct. By the way, it was a good precinct. You had good cops. You had honest, good, hardworking cops. But like in any job, you know, you had rogue cops. Right. The NYPD officer at the front desk was such a good person, Joe tends to believe in the good in people. The goal of this YouTube documentary series is to get Joe Sanchez an honorary reinstatement 30 years later.